nation. But it was in that city's Chinatown where Victory Day was the most joyous. Firecrackers that had been hoarded for years are set off in a triumphant roar. Although the war was over, the uphill struggle for more than 100,000 people was just beginning. The challenge for Japanese Americans and their parents? To fit back into an American society that had largely rejected them right after Pearl Harbor. After years of internment, they now had to pick up the pieces of their lives and start over. Many of them were afraid to leave the camp once the uh, WRA, or the War Relocation Authority, was told to empty the camp. Many of them had, were penniless. They lost everything they had. And while in camp, spent what little money they had. So they were really penniless. And to all of a sudden say, go back to a hostile environment, it scared many people. Leaving uh, the camp was sort of traumatic in itself, because everybody was leaving. And I remember having friends and families, they're all going now, leaving. And we're wondering whether we we're ever going to leave camp. So we got started. And coming in, that was how many years that we were in camp, I don't remember, but coming back out, that was that many years again when we saw the stores, any civilized store like at Parker. So I remember going into the, uh, the drug stores and my eyes just filled up with tears because there's all these goodies in there. And we never, uh, as kids, had that in our camp. Camp was one of the 10 internment camps in the United States that housed the Japanese and their American children, all evacuated from the West Coast in spring of 1942. Since they could only bring what they could carry, families were forced to sell or give away vehicles, appliances, furniture, and other possessions, all items they would need again when they left the relocation centers to rejoin civilian life. It would be three years behind barbed wire before most would return to their homes. But as soon as the fall of that year, the War Relocation Authority began to encourage some internees to leave the centers and to find jobs and homes as long as they were away from the West Coast. I was among the first to leave, but um, I was fortunate in that um, I worked for the assistant administrator there, and he was on loan from um, the National Park Service, and they were headquartered in Chicago. So I got a job in Chicago for the uh, National Park Service. My dad had gotten a job uh, teaching Japanese to U.S. military personnel at the University of Chicago, and so he left camp in March of 1943. Uh, by that time, my sisters and my brother had all left camp. And uh, so my dad had asked permission of the army that uh, my mother and I accompany him to, uh, uh, to the Chicago area since he was going to be teaching at the University of Chicago under the Army Specialized Training Program. Internees had to fill out an application if they wished to leave the internment camps, indicating that they had an outside sponsor, plus housing and job possibilities. Security checks were done, and final permits for leave were sometimes denied with no explanation. This WRA propaganda film called The Way Ahead tried to convince the evacuees to leave the relocation centers. If you don't have money enough to get to your new location, the government, through WRA, will make a grant of enough money to get you there, and a little extra until the paychecks start coming in. This money does not have to be repaid. It's a helping hand from Uncle Sam. It's a big moment when you start to pack for your trip outside. There are so many things to take, and you'll need most all of them. Yes, including Jimmy's roller skates. It's an even bigger moment when you walk through the gate for the last time, and present your pass to the guard for the last time and take a look at the barbed wire fence for the last time. Your friends, as they board the bus to leave the center, are going to new experiences and to a better way of living. The War Relocation Authority set up offices in 40 cities and towns across the country to help facilitate the resettlement process. In time, Japanese Americans had dispersed throughout the country east of the Sierra Nevada. 
they settled in big cities such as New York, Chicago, Washington, D.C., and in places like Madison, Wisconsin, Alexandria, Louisiana, and Omaha, Nebraska. Some communities welcomed the former internees. Japanese Americans, together with community groups, prepared orientation booklets in both English and Japanese for the resettlers. But the reception was not always so friendly. Salt Lake City was nice, quiet, put a clean town. But I, I remember one instant when my husband and I was walking Sunday, walking in downtown, and this young man in uniform approached us. And then he asked for the matches. He went and light the cigarette. So my husband reached in and gave it to him. Instead of taking the matches, he gave my husband a, you know, sock him. And then my husband tried to go back at him, but I pulled him away. Because I don't want to get more, you know, get involved with a fight or anything. And then he's wearing a uniform. You're not supposed to hit the man in a uniform. Although my husband told him, you know, I was in the Army too. But he didn't care because, you know, us Japanese walking downtown, I guess he didn't like it. Yeah. He, he called him, you dirty three word, you know. Fear of prejudice? Fear of the future and fear of the unknown kept many Japanese Americans inside the camps. Although the WRA tried to persuade them to leave and settle somewhere they'd never been before. This part of the propaganda film, The Way Ahead, highlighted Japanese Americans already at work in civilian life. Some people found the picture a little too rosy compared to reality. Every newspaper fairly screams with advertisement, help wanted. You can't walk down the streets of any city without seeing signs like these. There's a place for your ability, whatever it may be. And the opportunities are probably better now than they will be for years to come. As a tempor temporary measure, I uh, took the uh, job as uh, domestic help. One, one place. I, must, I must have stayed there for about a year and a half or so. I wanted to work in a lab, because that was my, uh, I was a chem major. And, uh, I was supposed to have an interview at a paint company. So a car came for me, a chauffeur. The chauffeur was Japanese. And he said to me, you don't want this job. He says, oh, there's no room in the lab for you now. What he wants you is for a babysitter. And don't take it. So I did not. Of course, it isn't all easy outside. There are difficulties, just as there always were, and some new ones as a result of the war. There's the problem of housing. In small towns or rural areas, it's generally not hard to find a place to live. But in most of the larger cities, housing is hard to get. Apartments advertised in morning papers are gone before noon. Some won't take children. Housing was hard to get. In the beginning, we were lucky to even get uh, one room. Roach infects, infested. You know. But um, when we started to look for housing, we decided to buy a flat, and um, my husband would go look, and by the time uh, any of the neighbors heard about it, then uh, they didn't want us. As I looked for a, an apartment to rent or boarding houses where I stayed, I put an ad in the paper and purposely put my name in, because I felt if anybody needed to know who I was or what I was, they could find out. It's probably the children who are influenced most by the way they live. They're going to grow up in the United States. It's their country. They may not object to the dust and wind of a relocation center, but there are other places that are more pleasant outside. And the adjustments to outside living are easy for them, as thousands of youngsters already have demonstrated. We moved to Evanston, Illinois, and I went to Haven Intermediate School. Um, of course, this is during World War II, and there are a lot of, um, of uh, public service announcements, PSAs as we would know them today, saying uh, things like, uh, you know, you can identify a spy right away. 
and they would be talking about Germans or Italians or Japanese. But when it came to the one uh, relating to Japanese, they'd always say, and you could always tell a spy because they can't pronounce their V's and their, uh, and their L's. Uh, they come out like B's and R's. And so when I would go to school, uh, kids would then uh, try all these rhymes. And they'd have V's and R's and L's and, and uh, uh, R's all intermixed. And I would go sailing through those things, pronouncing my V's or the B's, L's and R's, and they'd say, you sure you're Japanese? You sure you're not Indian? You know, what gives? But I was subjected to this kind of, you can tell the Japanese because they're slant-eyed, because they've got buck tooth. And it was just constant during World War II that all of us uh, were bombarded as, a, as, as Americans to this kind of propaganda. So we faced uh, discrimination a lot of it. And I remember my youngest, my oldest son, tried to enroll him in nursery school. Even the University of Chicago Lab School would not accept him. My son maybe went two days to nursery school, and they said the parents objected. I don't know what a mother has to do to prepare her children for things like that, you know, because you keep thinking, you keep hoping that it's not going to happen. But it does. Well, I feel all kinds of mixed emotions. I think. But I know I was in tears when uh, my son was uh, kicked out of nursery school. I think I could take more abuse if it's just on me, not on my child. Don't hurt him. was not yet over, the Japanese and their American children were allowed to return to the West Coast in January of 1945. For the most part, they were no longer perceived as a military threat, and the government did not want to pay for the cost of the internment camps any longer. Although the decision was made in the fall of 1944, President Franklin Roosevelt's campaign advisors recommended that it not be made public until after the November election for political reasons. Many Japanese who had begun new lives in the Midwest and East Coast decided to stay there. But others joining the tens of thousands still in the internment camps decided to move back home to the West Coast. It scared many people, especially uh, widows with small children or people that had no job prospects. It was a frightening thing all of a sudden say, all right, now you're free, go back. And so uh, they actually had difficulty clearing the last, the remaining uh, maybe 40, 50,000 people. Yoneji Takaha's elderly mother was one of those who refused to leave at first. Well, mainly because she said, you took us, my sons, and my daughters, and you, you threw us in this camp for no reason at all except that we were Japanese and they're American citizens, and you put us here, now you take us out. I ain't gonna go out. But the camps did close down, one at a time, with trainloads of Japanese Americans returning to the West Coast. They had to adjust to civilian life all over again, after being institutionalized for several years. Former Congressman Norman Mineta recalls a stopover in Billings, Montana, for the train back home to San Jose. So we rested there at the hotel, and then we went to uh, a little cafeteria uh, next door to the hotel. And as we finished the meal, I then started to stack up my dishes. Because in camp, we'd st stack up our dishes and take them to where the dishwashers were. And my mother, as I was stacking up the dishes, said, Norman, you're not going to have to do that anymore. So things like that I do remember in terms of trying to make the transition from what we were doing in camp to now being, quote, civilian, unquote, someone outside the camp. As we came through Vallejo and I smelled the fog and then sure reminded me of the coastside, you know, it was something that I, I really felt really good inside, you know, to be coming back to coast after four years. You know. 
but that joy at returning home was often mixed with fear. But it took an awful long time to, to not be afraid. When we first came out of camp, we relocated, I relocated to Los Angeles, and I stayed at that hostel. I stayed inside of the hostel for two solid weeks without leaving. I was so afraid. I was so afraid of, of meeting a Caucasian. And then if he called me a Jap, I, I don't know what I would have done. I think I would have just uh, uh, stayed indoors for the rest of my life. That hostel was one of many kinds of temporary housing situations for the returning evacuees. Many who came back home didn't have a home to live in. The government provided low-cost housing to those who needed it in places like trailer parks, barracks, and housing projects. Yoneji Takaha remembers the surplus war housing on San Francisco's Hunter's Point. It was the one rung up from the bottom, I guess. You know, the way I can... Because it was all so strange to me, you know, it was like living in a barracks, more or less, family. It wasn't, it wasn't much different from Topaz. They were confined to the housing project. And uh, but that's, uh, that's, that's what the government says is available. And, uh, and it irked me. Everything irked me. <laughs> You know, I didn't think they, that everything they did was, they, they were helping us, they were helping us, but it was, I, I really can't say what, uh, it's, they got along, I mean, but they got along because of themselves. You know, Richmond housing is almost like a two-day camp, like, same way they built fast, fast, Fast house, you know, uh, built real fast. And uh, wall is thin, uh, low ceiling, and uh, no extra room, you know. And, uh, I have four kids, and uh, so the six of us stay in, uh, I think, two bedroom house. Um, actually, apartment like. The biggest one has, uh, I think, three bedrooms. Others thought the public housing was luxurious compared to life in the internment camp. But with the children, we got a three bedroom. So we were lucky. So we had more space. But you only had the living room and the kitchen and the three bedrooms. And of course, the bathroom. Many had to find their own housing. So we all left for Spokane. But there were six in the family, and, and the only accommodations they had was a railroad car on the side without the wheels. And so my sister, who just graduated, uh, became a domestic in Spokane. So that left uh, five of us to stay in this railroad car. And we were only about 50 yards away from the main line, so all night long the trains just rumbled past us. Churches often became temporary hostels for the returnees until more permanent quarters could be found. We notified Reverend Buckham, and uh, he, uh, to, to, we notified Reverend Buckham that we are coming back so that he could, uh, uh, you know, open the, uh, the uh, Sturge uh, cottage again for us. So by that, he did that, and we came back, and the government uh, gave us uh, cots and uh, everything we needed, to, you know, to for sleeping quarters. So we had beds for about uh, 10 to 12 uh, beds there. And uh, we put in a phone and I put an ad in the Seventh Hill Times for work, uh, gardening or any, any type of work. And uh, as, uh, as, as they came out of the camp, they stayed there and I got them relocated. And then, you know, more come in. They kept, I, we did that for about a year. My folks' good friend moved back, and they were able to get back into their home. And we all lived at their place. We rented a room, two rooms, I remember. And um, 
there were 16 of us living in one flat with one bathroom. And in our family house, there were one, two, three, four, maybe five families that came and stayed with us. Uh, because in Alameda, in that block where I lived, there were uh, families that were living there before the war. And as the years went on, um, these families uh, obtained their home back again. And they gradually moved out of our, our house. Even those who owned their own homes but had leased it out during the internment ran into problems. So when we came back, we had a home. It was being rented out at the time we were interned. And we couldn't get the lady to move out. So we stayed in the attic. So it was a 10-room house. Then finally we told her we were going to fumigate the house, and she left. The house had been raided many times over. Um, our um, um, personal property with, and wedding gifts were scattered all over the neighborhood, split among the neighbors and, and so on. Our uh, mm, uh, silk kimonos, uh, the uh, doll collection, the ceremonial dolls for the doll festival. Um, uh, everything else uh, was raided, the trunks ripped open, the locks just hanging. Uh, doors of storage rooms uh, split and broken into. Uh, uh, the uh, Underwood uh, typewriter gone, the Hoover vacuum cleaner being used next door and gone. All along the West Coast, vandals had targeted Japanese Americans and their property. In Fresno, vandals broke into the Fresno government warehouse, where evacuee property was stored. A garage was also set afire there. A fish market in Guadalupe, California was another target. In Los Angeles, both the Buddhist temple and the White Star Soda Works were hit, as well as a warehouse. At the Buddhist church in Tacoma, Washington, trunks and stored chests were pilfered during the war. But not everybody had a bad experience. Mr. Galen Wolf, uh, a well-known watercolor artist on the West Coast Guard, said he would take care of his, uh, our personal goods in his barn. But the story goes that when we came back, we heard from the townspeople that Mr. Galen Wolf's brother, by the name of Joe, tried to burn all our equipment and our uh, personal belongings. So Mr. Wolf turned a shotgun on his brother and said that those are my friend's personal belongings, and if you touch them, I'll shoot you. So he left him alone. It's funny, you manage some way or the other, because we had nothing, not a pan, not a chopstick, not a bowl, and we did have to buy all that. Oh, I just came through. It's kind of hard to go back about 50, 60 years and think, gee, how did we manage? But fortunately, and my husband was a hardworking man. He worked very hard. Finding a job in those days became a matter of survival. Family units began to disintegrate as children began to leave home as quickly as they could to find work. Mas Yamasaki and his brother left home at ages 16 and 17. I felt I wanted to help the family. And my brother and I felt that there would be two mouths less to feed. And if we were on our own, they didn't have to worry about us. And I wanted to assure my parents that don't worry about us. We'll, we'll do it on our own, and I think we could make it. And the only jobs available was room and board, and we're house boys. And we decided, gee, who wants to do that? But we had no choice. I'm willing to do it. One thing good about Samet Hill was that Hillsboro, they were just uh, looking for uh, people to come and live in and work as domestics, maids, and things like that. So if you wanted to go, uh, Although they, they weren't going to be working as a, you know, domestic all their life, but uh, to uh, find a place, so well, that was the easiest place to find. So uh, that's where they, uh, they uh, we try to get jobs where they're willing to have room to take uh, in uh, couples to uh, work. But when I came back to Berkeley, 
and tried to find a job, then I knew what discrimination was because I would I went to um, down to Cutter Laboratory and they would not accept an, a, a, um, a form for me for employment. And I didn't even get into the employment office. And then one of my friends talked to Dr. Cutter and said, you know, you let me and my dad work on your camellias and your gardens and everything, but you don't let Japanese work in your laboratory down there. And I got a call the next day, and I was in. I didn't have to fill out anything. I was in. <laughs> and I worked there for five years. I think many of the Niseis, San Francisco Niseis, worked at Simmons. Somebody was telling me that at that time, that was the best uh, employment place for Niseis because the boss, whoever was the boss at Simmons at that time, like the Japanese American uh, people. Ironically, the very government that discriminated by putting the Japanese Americans in camp ended up being one of the biggest employers once they got out. It took me like two weeks to find a job. First, I applied at Chronicle because there was a job available for a typist. But they said that job was filled. And I noticed the ad was still in the paper for a week after that. Then I went to the federal housing and they took me in. They were great. Mel Tominaga left a good job in Chicago when he came back to the East Bay and felt the sting of discrimination. I walked from here to Alameda Naval Air Station and back. I stopped in every place that there was a job available, like Key System, for instance, or the mattress company. He said, I'll hire you if you could string that spring, you know, tie that spring. I never saw anything like that. I just wanted to go start someplace. And so I didn't qualify. So I can understand that part of it. Uh, tree topping man, many, many jobs I applied for. Tree topping job, and you say, what kind of name is that? What does the name have anything to do with it? But no, so be it. I mean, in that time, it was that way. And that was very discouraging to me, you know. Uh, and uh, I thought, gee, if, if there's anything I can do to help him, uh, you know, that would be uh, something that uh, I would really desire most at that time. I, I felt sort of uh, not sorry, but uh, helpless, that I really felt that I wanted to do something for him. But uh, as you mentioned, you know, opportunities were different in those days. It was very hard. Um, some people, they didn't really avoid you, but knew that you were of Japanese descent coming back to Berkeley, and they were courteous to you, but you knew that there was a, something there. So I said, I gotta hurry up and find a job. I can't, otherwise I'm gonna have to hurt somebody, I thought to myself. Permanent housing was a major concern for the returnees because in cities like Berkeley, there were unwritten rules as to where the Japanese could rent or buy and where they weren't wanted, usually on the right side of the tracks. This policy didn't just exist in Berkeley, but in almost every city in the Bay Area. I looked around and, you know, when I got over there, the house is getting ready and they're putting a sign up and they tell me, this is on Sacramento Street, a uh, little bit lower than uh, University Avenue. He said, this house isn't for you, Phil. I'm sorry, you can't buy this. This is off limits to you. So I, I understand what he was saying. After I had come out of the camp and I moved down to Hayward and uh, we wanted to buy a house and uh, this new tract uh, uh, manager, he says they're all sold out, yet they're selling to other people. So if they don't want us to uh, buy a house there, why I said, I can look elsewhere. There were new ho homes that were being built out there in Daily, Daily City. And uh, we went to buy a home there and wanted to put a down payment on it. And they, they just completely refused, flatly refused, and said, well, we can't have you here. Well, my wife called the real estate agent uh, in the Woodside Hills. And uh, when she went to her appointment, the lady said they had nothing available. Uh, there was a covenant 
in the uh, subdivision of Woodside Hills that said that uh, Asians, the only Asians who could live in Woodside Hills were servants uh, and housekeepers. My husband wanted to come farther into San Mateo because he used to live up on 28th and Monterey, and that was you know, about 10 minutes drive for him, and he wanted a place closer into town where he could come home for lunch and, and, and a larger home because by that time we had four children. And um, it took us a year to find a house with the help of this man by the name of Montgomery Reynolds, who was a, uh, a real estate man who had decided that he was near the end of his career, and one thing that he was going to do before he was kicked off the real estate board, and he knew that was going to happen, was to integrate San Mateo. And so we were the first family that he was able to place in an all-white neighborhood. I think even nowadays people might even think that that's silly, but in 1959 that was a very serious issue. I mean, it was written up in all the papers, and the ACLU became involved, and it was a big to-do that this uh, Montgomery Reynolds had uh, succeeded in um, finding us a home in Baywood. It wasn't just discrimination in housing or jobs that the Japanese experienced. In some cases, the prejudice was so intense that it became life-threatening. Someone was trying to burn us out of our own home. They did a fire. Our house was built up on the stilts. We were about three feet off the ground because it was in a flood area. And so they poured probably gasoline underneath our house to try to start a fire. And we had a wood pile in the back also. They had lit that. And so my, my sister was with us because she was pregnant at the time. And she smelled this gasoline. And so she came into our bedroom, and then we could see the flames coming out of our bed uh, underneath the house. So we all panicked. We turned all the lights on, naturally, you know, try to get around. And that's when we discovered that wood pile was on fire. We put that out. And so my brother got an ax and broke the ventilator cover off the bottom of our home there. And fortunately for us, we had some soil there, so we doused it out with the soil. With the soil because water would not put out that type of flame. And while we were running around, my, mo my mother ran across the street to our neighbor to call the police. And then while she wasn't going over there, then we heard a car go by and fired two shots. And then came back again and fired another shot. Now, there were places like Salinas, Fresno, Stockton, where uh, people's homes were being firebombed, they were being uh, shot at. In fact, we even had a, a veteran from San Jose, uh, the 442nd, who had been wounded, and he was at the Veterans Hospital in Stockton, had come out on a Saturday to get a haircut downtown in S Stockton, and was shot and killed in downtown Stockton uh, just to get a haircut, and yet here he had survived all of World War II and was uh, recovering from his wounds at the Veterans Hospital and was shot and killed in, San Jose, uh, in Stockton. In nearby Livingston, California, the threat of violence was also very real. My mother, in the evenings, that the first home that we lived in was right next to the road. So she would always pull the shades down before she would turn the lights out because we were afraid that somebody might come by with a shotgun and just you know, randomly shoot into the house. It was that kind of an atmosphere. The grammar school teacher um, did, along with the students, and called me names, and uh, it was very difficult, and my folks never understood that. And I, I did tell them what happened. They said, well, you know, that you should be able to handle it yourself. When I was about seven or eight years old, I decided maybe I would try another barber. I, not that I disliked the uh, the community person that uh, I was getting my hair cut from at the time, but I just felt like I was going to, wanted to try s something else. So I went downtown, and uh, on B Street, there was a, a barber shop, a white barber, and I was not thinking about anything else. I just uh, walked into the barber shop uh, hoping to get my hair cut, and then I was told that uh, he couldn't cut my hair. 
And so I was really stunned uh, and upset, uh, not outwardly, but in, inside, in terms of the way I was feeling, that, uh, that he wouldn't cut my hair. Um, I don't think he expressed anything about my ethnicity, but I, I certainly felt it and knew that there was something about what was going on that, uh, um, that he uh, just didn't want to cut uh, a Japanese-American person's, uh, person's hair. The first problem or anxiety that I had was when my mother died. Um, I thought, now, what funeral home would take a Japanese? Um, and I happened to have a neighbor who had lost her husband, and I asked her, talk to the people at the funeral home for us first. Well, my uh, dad started up his insurance agency again, and I remember he used to have a stack of automobile and fire insurance applications. And he went back to some of the companies that he represented before World War II, and they all refused to write any of that insurance because there were stories of fire bombings uh, on farms and homes up and down the state of California. I was coming down uh, Mount Diablo, and uh, there was a stop sign on El Camino, and, and uh, it was a goal for me, and this other car went right through the stoplight and uh, hit my back end and did a, quite a bit of damage. So naturally, I figured that the only way to uh, have it, you know, fixed because uh, I don't know the insurance that I had in uh, Topajita would be any good here. Uh, so I thought I would like to go and uh, speak to a lawyer. Then I remember this uh, Raymond Daba, who was went to school, you know, in San Mateo High School. I uh, had an office, so I went to him and I told him that uh, I had an accident and uh, I was not at fault and would like to see if I could collect damages, which meant that I had to sue. And first thing he said to me was, uh, uh, I wouldn't even try, to, I wouldn't even attempt to do anything. So you'd just be wasting money trying to uh, bring it to court. So I figured, well, that's the way it is. Well, the, you know. It's, so we just had to take the, uh, whatever happened, we just always were the fault, you know. Well, we asked the service station attendant, where's a good place to get a bite to eat? He said, around the corner, there's a nice restaurant. So I went there and I sat at the table there and waited. I waited for a little while and then the waiter came along and says, what you want? And I told him I want this. This, uh, menu. Then here comes a heaping salad bowl, really heaping. So I said, "What? They welcome me, Mr. President, or something?" So I looked around, and and here's other people uh, busy eating the salad bowl, and it's very flat. So he took the fork and turned it over, but it's out of slimy, off the garbage can, covered up with with uh, regular salad. So we called the waiters and they told me, you give me my ticket, paid it, went on to Los Angeles. The pain of isolation and rejection hasn't gone away in the last 50 years. Even today, many Japanese Americans tell us that in most cases, they still feel most comfortable among other Japanese Americans. So it has nothing to do with our being cliquish. You know, it was a mechanism of, of self-defense for us you know, to socialize basically with, our, with other Japanese. I have Hagujin friends, but I've never been able to uh, pick up with anybody I knew before. And it's not like I blame them or I feel guilty, but maybe there's something there. I, I don't know. Right after the war, it was very hard, very difficult for me to get into the, uh, assimilate with the rest of the crowd because here, it's like a person being in prison, right? Uh, I had this invisible prison stripe, so to speak, and I had this complex of people saying, oh, that's the guy that was in camp or in prison. And that kind of uh, indicated that we did something bad. And even though the only crime that we were faced with was because we looked like the enemy, but you couldn't help but feeling this way. 
my age and younger, we tend to have more friends from the outside community. But I notice many of the older Niseis, they stick to their own uh, church groups, Boy Scout groups, and they're very close-knit, and they don't open themselves out to the general uh, well, society as such. And uh, this is all because they were hurt, and they're afraid to open up anymore. And I think if you observe these things, you'll see how deep the hurt was. But they just don't go out yelling and screaming. It's just not part of their uh, way of uh, being brought up and their basic philosophy in there. So the watchword of the post-war era became acceptance in two ways, trying to accept the experience of evacuation, internment, and resettlement, and to be accepted back into mainstream America. So the only thing I know that my parents admonished me to do was be American, be Western, don't be, don't be Japanese. So don't, don't speak Japanese, try to, try to do everything in English. Well, for years as a kid, I'd sit there like this, trying, and I'd be before the mirror, trying to keep sure my eyes were always big and not round and, or, or might be appeared to be a slant-eyed, so to speak. And so, I mean, you just constantly uh, do things to try to deny anything Japanese and try to emphasize your Americanness. I really wanted to go into the service and serve my country. I, I didn't feel there was any uh, reluctance on my part not to serve. I felt that, uh, on the contrary, I felt that I should serve, I must serve, or I would like very much to serve, uh, in spite of what happened to my family and myself. Well, I'm an American. Uh, I have to uh, do my duty to my country if I could, in whatever capacity. I think many Niseis felt this way, and that's why Niseis serve with such great distinction, both in Europe and in the Pacific. I give a lot of credit to the 442 for its record, and uh, no one could deny the uh, loyalty of the Japanese Americans. And uh, I, th I don't think anyone dared question the loyalty of Japanese Americans after that. Many Issei wanted to become American citizens, a privilege that was legally denied to them in 1924. So in 1952, the Japanese American Citizens League spearheaded a drive to get the Walter McCarran Immigration and Naturalization Act passed to gain citizenship for the Japanese who had been ineligible before. It fulfilled the dreams of many, many Issei's who spent their whole life, adult life here, raised their families here, went to the camp experience, but still America was, the United States was their home. And so um, even my father was probably in his late 60s by then. All of these uh, Issei's applied for citizenship and they had a large mass induction of people at in San Francisco, I recall. And uh, my father was one of the proud uh, recipients of citizenship at that time. What started as a drive for citizenship and basic civil rights has turned into political clout for Japanese Americans. Senator Dan Inoue and representatives Patsy Mink and Robert Matsui are in Congress. It all started as a vision many decades ago in places all around the country after the war. We were very fortunate in San Jose to have a person by the name of I.K. Ishimatsu. And Mr. Ishimatsu was an Issei, a very, very successful business person. And uh, after he returned in 1946, he said, this is never going to happen to us again. So um, he would go around collecting a dollar or two uh, from people and then uh, you know, political dinners were probably uh, $25 a head. Well, they didn't have $25 to be able to go to a function, but he would collect uh, money and then put $25, $50, $100 dollars together, wh whatever, and then send two or three Niseis to political dinners. And out of that was formed in Santa Clara County, the Nisei Democrats of Santa Clara County. 
the desire to be accepted and to be treated equally manifested itself in different ways. The evacuation and internment experience had left deep emotional scars in the Japanese-American psyche. I don't know how someone else would uh, feel, but uh, to me, uh, you know, you just come back and uh, you're kind of afraid, you know. You're, you're not, uh, you don't have the, uh, you, you can't stand up to yourself and say, well, I'm, uh, it's, uh, you know, I should be uh, uh, able to do what everyone else is uh, able to do, but uh, you figure that uh, we're being, uh, well, being at war, well, we just have to take it, I guess, so. I have to look at people just like us that were raised in different areas, like Japanese in Hawaii or Japanese in Brazil, and I know that, that we are far more, uh, far more quiet and less likely to make waves, as you say, or uh, very careful to follow the rules. Uh, I avoided uh, those kinds of unpleasantness. Uh, if I felt the situation occurring or coming up, uh, that would, uh, would put me in a position of being very uncomfortable. I would try to avoid it. And it's um, a very, uh, what do you call it, damaging in a sense to your self-esteem when you feel people are judging you just by how you look instead of who you are. And uh, you tend to become careful. And I think this carried over even to the third generation. Uh, people may not agree with me, but I think a lot of the third generation are not as aggressive as they could or should be. Uh, say, compared to the Chinese Americans, I think they're a lot more aggressive than the third generation Japanese Americans. But I think third generation Japanese Americans were uh, affected by the Niseis who became very careful and cautious about being accepted. There were probably times and situations where I feel like I did have to compensate, either to work harder uh, or to be better or to do something that would um, perhaps compensate for whatever deficiency I might have, deficiency I may have felt uh, about being a, a minority person. You know, on reflection, um, maybe that's part of uh, what we have to do. I guess, you know, as minorities, we do have to work harder to be treated equally. And uh, so I guess maybe that's the kind of thing that has uh, driven Norm. Um, it's uh, a need every day, I guess you might say, to have to prove yourself. Uh, we were told that the one thing we had to do is to excel. And uh, in the Western culture, we had to be, you know, number one, do, do good in everything. And so essentially, I, I try my best to do everything um, in academics and sports and uh, doing community work, volunteer stuff, all the way through from even elementary school. And um, I think that's, maybe that's the way it's been for a lot of these Japanese families, that uh, they want you to do really good and don't embarrass the family. You know, don't do anything that's going to um, embarrass your parents or your grandparents. The problem that we as uh, Asian Pacific Americans and more specifically Japanese Americans I think face today is that um, uh, we're treated as the model minority. But that really uh, covers up a lot of problems that still exist uh, in terms of prejudice and discrimination. Even to this day, my that's the child that lives in Columbus. His children came home, and he wa they wanted to know if they were Chinese or Japanese because then their kid, their friends said Jin Jin Chinaman to them, and until then they didn't know discrimination. So it's still there. In 1988, after nearly a decade of legislative effort, President Ronald Reagan signed the Redress Bill called for $20,000 in reparations to each evacuee and a formal apology. The legislation itself has uh, a, probably the language in there 
that uh, to me is the most moving of any uh, bill I've ever been involved in. And that was a part of the bill that, where the last sentence of the bill says, and on behalf of the nation, the Congress apologizes. That to me is uh, just very, very meaningful. Sure, the $20,000 uh, is nice. Uh, it doesn't uh, compensate for what people lost uh, in uh, 1942 through 1945. Uh, it was just, uh, uh, you might say, uh, a redress for a wrong that was committed. Uh, most of us when we say we're just at the point where now we're going to do it, a, you know, when the war came and we just slammed into the darn concentration camp. In, in a way, uh, like uh, even now, I think, gee, when am I going to start my regular life? You know? Because we come back and I figure, well, we're going to start, I'm going to do my uh, whatever my career I'm going to go into and all that. And uh, each year, whether 10 years later, 20 years later, she said, gee, it's about time I'm going to start my life. And here, I'm 80 years old, and I still never got to the point where I felt that uh, I pursued my career. It just seemed like it just, with the war, it just went away. After having uh, been married in October, having our own home, having all the uh, necessities that we had, and having just gotten a promotion and so on, and life was, uh, seemed to be on the upswing when the war broke out. But uh, the hardest thing was the matter of readjusting to that degree. Life is what you make it, and I think uh, if you want to be bitter about things, you probably die bitter. But if you want to accept things as they are and make the best of it, uh, I think that's the way we should all try to, to live. You know, I think as a group, we're very resourceful. We try to forget the past and um, do the best we can. And I think we've all done that. Try not to hold prejudices. And we hope that through our experience and our, well, our philosophy of life or whatever it is, can show others that uh, no matter what the circumstances are, that they could overcome it. We as uh, Americans of Japanese ancestry who experienced this uh, forced uh, evacuation and internment are the best to tell the story about what happened to us. And that's why I participate in things like Day of Remembrance uh, ceremonies, because it is important that we not only tell our own children about what happened in those years, but to teach the children of all Americans about what happened so that the Constitution will be able to protect all of us in the future. Production of Starting Over, Japanese Americans After the War, is made possible by Chevron Corporation. The Henry and Tomoe Takahashi Charitable Foundation. 
the Ray and Peggy Daba Fund. This is PBS.